Metaphysics, Wikipedia article audio. Metaphysics is a branch of philosophy exploring the fundamental questions, including the nature of concepts like being, existence, and reality. It has two branches cosmology and ontology. Traditional metaphysics seeks to answer, in a suitably abstract and fully general manner, the questions. Etymology Central questions Ontology Identity and change Causality and time Necessity and possibility Cosmology and cosmogony Mind and matter Determinism and free will Metaphysics and science Rejections of metaphysics History and schools of metaphysics Prehistory Bronze Age Pre-Socratic Greece Chinese metaphysics Socrates and Plato Aristotle Classical India Skye Vdnte Buddhist metaphysics Islamic metaphysics Scholasticism and the Middle Ages Rationalism and Continental Rationalism British Empiricism Topics of metaphysical investigation include existence, objects and their properties, space and time, cause and effect, and possibility. A central branch of metaphysics is ontology, the investigation into the basic categories of being and how they relate to one another. Kant Kantians There are two broad conceptions about what world is studied by metaphysics. The strong, classical view assumes that the objects studied by metaphysics exist independently of any observer, so that the subject is the most fundamental of all sciences. The modern view assumes that the objects studied by metaphysics exist inside the mind of an observer, so the subject becomes a form of introspection and conceptual analysis. Some philosophers, notably Kant, discuss both of these worlds and what can be inferred about each one. Early Analytical Philosophy and Positivism Continental Philosophy some philosophers, such as the logical positivists, and many scientists reject the entire subject of metaphysics as meaningless and unverifiable, while others disagree and think that it is legitimate. The word metaphysics derives from the Greek words mu epsilon tau and phi upsilon sigma iota kappa. It was first used as the title for several of Aristotle's works because they were usually anthologized after the works on physics in complete editions. The prefix meta indicates that these works come after the chapters on physics. However, Aristotle himself did not call the subject of these books metaphysics, he referred to it as first philosophy. The editor of Aristotle's works, Andronic Use of Rhodes, is thought to have placed the books on first philosophy right after another work, physics, and called them tau mu epsilon tau tau phi upsilon sigma iota kappa beta iota beta lambda alpha or the books after the physics. This was misread by Latin scholiasts, who thought it meant the science of what is beyond the physical. However, once the name was given, the commentators sought to find intrinsic reasons for its appropriateness. For instance, it was understood to mean the science of the world beyond nature, that is, the science of the immaterial. Again, it was understood to refer to the chronological or pedagogical order among our philosophical studies, so that the metaphysical sciences would mean those that we study after having mastered the sciences that deal with the physical world. A person who does, 
or is doing, metaphysics is called a metaphysician. There is a related use of the term, equating the metaphysical with the non-physical, metaphysical healing means healing by means of remedies that are not physical. Ontology is the philosophical study of the nature of being, becoming, existence or reality, as well as the basic categories of being and their relations. Traditionally listed as the core of metaphysics, ontology often deals with questions concerning what entities exist or may be said to exist and how such entities may be grouped, related within a hierarchy, and subdivided according to similarities and differences. Although ontology as a philosophical enterprise is highly hypothetical, it also has practical application in information science and technology such as ontology engineering. Identity is a fundamental metaphysical issue. Metaphysicians investigating identity are tasked with the question of what, exactly, it means for something to be identical to itself. Other issues of identity arise in the context of time, what does it mean for something to be itself across two moments in time? How do we account for this? Another question of identity arises when we ask what our criteria ought to be for determining identity. And how does the reality of identity interface with linguistic expressions? The metaphysical positions one takes on identity have far-reaching implications on issues such as the mind-body problem, personal identity, ethics, and law. The ancient Greeks took extreme positions on the nature of change. Parmenides denied change altogether, while Heraclitus argued that change was ubiquitous, oh you cannot step into the same river twice. Identity, sometimes called numerical identity, is the relation that a thing bears to itself, and which no thing bears to anything other than itself. A modern philosopher who made a lasting impact on the philosophy of identity was Leibniz, whose law of the indiscernibility of identicals is still in wide use today. It states that if some object X is identical to some object Y, then any property that X has, Y will have as well. Put formally, it states. However, it seems, too that objects can change over time. If one were to look at a tree one day, and the tree later lost a leaf, it would seem that one could still be looking at that same tree. Two rival theories to account for the relationship between change and identity are perdurantism, which treats the tree as a series of tree stages, and endurantism which maintains that the organism the same tree is present at every stage in its history. Classical philosophy recognized a number of causes, including teleological future causes. In special relativity and quantum field theory the notions of space, time, and causality become tangled together, with temporal orders of causations becoming dependent on who is observing them. The laws of physics are symmetrical in time, so could equally well be used to describe time as running backwards. Why then do we perceive it as flowing in one direction, the arrow of time, and as containing causation flowing in the same direction? Causality is usually required as a foundation for philosophy of science if science aims to understand causes and effects and make predictions about them. Metaphysicians investigate questions about the ways the world could have been. David Lewis, in On the Plurality of Worlds, endorsed a view called concrete modal realism, according to which facts about how things could have been are made true by other concrete worlds, just as in ours, in which things are different. Other philosophers, such as Gottfried Leibniz, have dealt with the idea of possible worlds as well. The idea of necessity is that any necessary fact is true across all possible worlds. 
A possible fact is true in some possible world, even if not in the actual world. For example, it is possible that cats could have had two tails, or that any particular apple could have not existed. By contrast, certain propositions seem necessarily true, such as analytic propositions, e.g., all bachelors are unmarried. The particular example of analytic truth being necessary is not universally held among philosophers. A less controversial view might be that self-identity is necessary, as it seems fundamentally incoherent to claim that for any X, it is not identical to itself, this is known as the law of identity, a putative first principle. Aristotle describes the principle of non-contradiction, it is impossible that the same quality should both belong and not belong to the same thing. This is the most certain of all principles. Wherefore they who demonstrate refer to this as an ultimate opinion. For it is by nature the source of all the other axioms. Metaphysical cosmology is the branch of metaphysics that deals with the world as the totality of all phenomena in space and time. Historically, it has had a broad scope, and in many cases was founded in religion. The ancient Greeks drew no distinction between this use and their model for the cosmos. However, in modern times it addresses questions about the universe which are beyond the scope of the physical sciences. It is distinguished from religious cosmology in that it approaches these questions using philosophical methods. Cosmogony deals specifically with the origin of the universe. Modern metaphysical cosmology and cosmogony try to address questions such as The nature of matter was a problem in its own right in early philosophy. Aristotle himself introduced the idea of matter in general to the Western world, adapting the term hyl, which originally meant lumber. Early debates centered on identifying a single underlying principle. Water was claimed by Thales, air by Anaximenes, a pyron by Anaximander, fire by Heraclitus. Democritus, in conjunction with his mentor, Leucippus, conceived of an atomic theory some 24 centuries before it was accepted by modern science. It is worth noting, However, that the grounds necessary to ensure validity to the proposed theory's veridical nature were not scientific, but just as philosophical as those traditions espoused by Thales and Anaximander. The nature of the mind and its relation to the body has been seen as more of a problem as science has progressed in its mechanistic understanding of the brain and body. Proposed solutions often have ramifications about the nature of mind as a whole. René Descartes proposed substance dualism, a theory in which mind and body are essentially different, with the mind having some of the attributes traditionally assigned to the soul, in the 17th century. This creates a conceptual puzzle about how the two interact. Evidence of a close relationship between brain and mind, such as the Phineas Gage case, have made this form of dualism increasingly unpopular. Another proposal discussing the mind-body problem is idealism, in which the material is sweepingly eliminated in favor of the mental. Idealists, such as George Berkeley, claim that material objects do not exist unless perceived and only as perceptions. The German idealists such as Fichte, Hegel and Schopenhauer took Kant as their starting point, although it is debatable how much of an idealist Kant himself was. Idealism is also a common theme in Eastern philosophy. Related ideas are panpsychism and panexperientialism which say everything has a mind rather than everything exists in a mind. Alfred North Whitehead was a 20th century exponent of this approach. Idealism is a monistic theory which holds that there is a single universal substance or principle. 
Neutral Monism, Associated in Different Forms with Ernst Mach, William James, Bertrand Russell, The Adherence of American New Realism, Moritz Schlick, A.J. Ayer and others, seeks to be less extreme than idealism, and to avoid the problems of substance dualism. It is unlike the double aspect theory in claiming that existence consists of a single substance that in itself is neither mental nor physical, but is capable of mental and physical aspects or attributes thus it implies a dual aspect theory. Neutral monism merely claims that everything, either physical or mental, can be constructed out of neutral elements, though not necessarily the same ones. For the last 100 years, the dominant metaphysics has without a doubt been materialistic monism. Type identity theory, token identity theory, functionalism, reductive physicalism, non-reductive physicalism, eliminative materialism, anomalous monism, property dualism, epiphenomenalism, and emergence are just some of the candidates for a scientifically informed account of the mind. Prominent recent philosophers of mind include David Armstrong, Ned Block, David Chalmers, Patricia, and Paul Chichland, Donald Davidson, Daniel Dennett, Fred Dritsk, Douglas Hofstadter, Roger Lines, Jerry Fodor, David Lewis, Thomas Nagel, Hilary Putnam, John Searle, John Smart, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Fred Allen Wolf. Determinism is the philosophical proposition that every event, including human cognition, decision, and action, is causally determined by an unbroken chain of prior occurrences. It holds that nothing happens that has not already been determined. The principal consequence of the deterministic claim is that it poses a challenge to the existence of free will. The problem of free will is the problem of whether rational agents exercise control over their own actions and decisions. Addressing this problem requires understanding the relation between freedom and causation, and determining whether the laws of nature are causally deterministic. Some philosophers, known as incompatibilists, view determinism and free will as mutually exclusive. If they believe in determinism, they will therefore believe free will to be an illusion, a position known as hard determinism. Proponents range from Barak Spinoza to Ted Honderich. Others, labeled compatibilists, believe that the two ideas can be reconciled coherently. Adherents of this view include Thomas Hobbes and many modern philosophers such as John Martin Fisher. What is the origin of the universe? What is its first cause? Is its existence necessary? What are the ultimate material components of the universe? What is the ultimate reason for the existence of the universe? Does the cosmos have a purpose? Process Metaphysics Later Analytical Philosophy Bibliography Epistemological, knowledge of the forms is more certain than mere sensory data, ethical, the form of the good sets an objective standard for morality, time and change, the world of the forms is eternal and unchanging. Time and change belong only to the lower sensory world. Time is a moving image of eternity. Abstract objects and mathematics, numbers, geometrical figures, etc., exist mind independently in the world of forms. Leibniz proposed in his monadology a plurality of non-interacting substances, Descartes is famous for his dualism of material and mental substances, Spinoza believed reality was a single substance of God or nature. Incompatibilists who accept free will but reject determinism are called libertarians, a term not to be confused with the political sense. Robert Kane and Alvin Plantinga are modern defenders of this theory. Prior to the modern history of science, 
scientific questions were addressed as a part of natural philosophy. Originally, the term science simply meant knowledge. The scientific method, however, transformed natural philosophy into an empirical activity deriving from experiment, unlike the rest of philosophy. By the end of the 18th century, it had begun to be called science to distinguish it from philosophy. Thereafter, metaphysics denoted philosophical inquiry of a non-empirical character into the nature of existence. Metaphysics continues asking why where science leaves off. For example, any theory of fundamental physics is based on some set of axioms, which may postulate the existence of entities such as atoms, particles, forces, charges, mass, or fields. Stating such postulates is considered to be the end of a science theory. Metaphysics takes these postulates and explores what they mean as human concepts. For example, do all theories of physics require the existence of space and time, objects and properties? Or can they be expressed using only objects, or only properties? Do the objects have to retain their identity over time or do they change? If they change, then are they still the same object? Can theories be reformulated by converting properties or predicates into entities? Is the distinction between objects and properties fundamental to the physical world or to our perception of it? Much recent work has been devoted to analyzing the role of metaphysics in scientific theorizing. Alexander Coyer led this movement, declaring in his book Metaphysics and Measurement, it is not by following experiment, but by outstripping experiment, that the scientific mind makes progress. Imre Lakatos maintained that all scientific theories have a metaphysical hardcore essential for the generation of hypotheses and theoretical assumptions. Thus, according to Lakatos, scientific changes are connected with vast cataclysmic metaphysical revolutions. An example from biology of Lakatos' thesis David Hull has argued that changes in the ontological status of the species concept have been central in the development of biological thought from Aristotle through Cuvier, Lamarck, and Darwin. Darwin's ignorance of metaphysics made it more difficult for him to respond to his critics because he could not readily grasp the ways in which their underlying metaphysical views differed from his own. In physics, New metaphysical ideas have arisen in connection with quantum mechanics, where subatomic particles arguably do not have the same sort of individuality as the particulars with which philosophy has traditionally been concerned. Also, adherence to a deterministic metaphysics in the face of the challenge posed by the quantum mechanical uncertainty principle led physicists such as Albert Einstein to propose alternative theories that retained determinism. A. N. Whitehead is famous for creating a process philosophy metaphysics inspired by electromagnetism and special relativity. In chemistry, Gilbert Newton Lewis addressed the nature of motion, arguing that an electron should not be said to move when it has none of the properties of motion. Catherine Hawley notes that the metaphysics even of a widely accepted scientific theory may be challenged if it can be argued that the metaphysical presuppositions of the theory make no contribution to its predictive success. A number of individuals have suggested that much or all of metaphysics should be rejected. In the 18th century, David Hume took an extreme position, arguing that all genuine knowledge involves either mathematics or matters of fact and that metaphysics, which goes beyond these, is worthless. He concludes his inquiry concerning human understanding with the statement, If we take in our hand any volume, of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? 
no. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Thirty-three years after Hume's inquiry appeared, Immanuel Kant published his Critique of Pure Reason. Although he followed Hume in rejecting much of previous metaphysics, he argued that there was still room for some synthetic a priori knowledge, concerned with matters of fact yet obtainable independent of experience. These included fundamental structures of space, time, and causality. He also argued for the freedom of the will and the existence of things in themselves, the ultimate objects of experience. Wittgenstein introduced the concept that metaphysics could be influenced by theories of aesthetics, via logic, viscount a world composed of atomical facts. In the 1930s, A. J. Ayer and Rudolf Carnap endorsed Hume's position, Carnap quoted the passage above. They argued that metaphysical statements are neither true nor false but meaningless since, according to their verifiability theory of meaning, a statement is meaningful only if there can be empirical evidence for or against it. Thus, while Ayer rejected the monism of Spinoza, he avoided a commitment to pluralism, the contrary position, by holding both views to be without meaning. Carnap took a similar line with the controversy over the reality of the external world. While the logical positivism movement is now considered dead, it has continued to influence philosophy development. Arguing against such rejections, the scholastic philosopher Edward Fieser has observed that Hume's critique of metaphysics, and specifically Hume's fork, is notoriously self-refuting. Fieser argues that Hume's fork itself is not a conceptual truth and is not empirically testable. Some living philosophers, such as Amy Thomason, have argued that many metaphysical questions can be dissolved just by looking at the way we use words, others, such as Ted Sider, have argued that metaphysical questions are substantive, and that we can make progress toward answering them by comparing theories according to a range of theoretical virtues inspired by the sciences, such as simplicity and explanatory power. Cognitive archaeology such as analysis of cave paintings and other prehistoric art and customs suggests that a form of perennial philosophy or shamanism metaphysics may stretch back to the birth of behavioral modernity, all around the world. Similar beliefs are found in present-day Stone Age cultures such as Australian Aboriginals. Perennial philosophy postulates the existence of a spirit or concept world alongside the day-to-day -day world, and interactions between these worlds during dreaming and ritual, or on special days or at special places. It has been argued that perennial philosophy formed the basis for Platonism, with Plato articulating, rather than creating, much older widespread beliefs. Bronze Age cultures such as ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt developed belief systems based on mythology, anthropomorphic gods, mind-body dualism, and a spirit world, to explain causes and cosmology. These cultures appear to have been interested in astronomy and may have associated or identified the stars with some of these entities. In ancient Egypt, the ontological distinction between order and chaos seems to have been important. The first named Greek philosopher, according to Aristotle, is Thales of Miletus, early 6th century BCE. He made use of purely physical explanations to explain the phenomena of the world rather than the mythological and divine explanations of tradition. He is thought to have posited water as the single underlying principle of the material world. His fellow, but younger Miltians, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, 
also posited monistic underlying principles, namely a pyron and air respectively. Another school was the Eleatics, in southern Italy. The group was founded in the early 5th century BCE by Parmenides, and included Zeno of Elia and Melisus of Samos. Methodologically, the Eleatics were broadly rationalist, and took logical standards of clarity and necessity to be the criteria of truth. Parmenides' chief doctrine was that reality is a single unchanging and universal being. Zeno used reductio ad absurdum, to demonstrate the illusory nature of change and time in his paradoxes. Heraclitus of Ephesus, in contrast, made change central, teaching that all things flow. His philosophy, expressed in brief aphorisms, is quite cryptic. For instance, he also taught the unity of opposites. Democritus and his teacher Lysippus, are known for formulating an atomic theory for the cosmos. They are considered forerunners of the scientific method. Metaphysics in Chinese philosophy can be traced back to the earliest Chinese philosophical concepts from the Zhou dynasty such as Tian and Yin and Yang. The 4th century BCE saw a turn towards cosmogony with the rise of Taoism and sees the natural world as dynamic and constantly changing processes which spontaneously arise from a single immanent metaphysical source or principle. Another philosophical school which arose around this time was the school of naturalists which saw the ultimate metaphysical principle as the Taiji, the supreme polarity composed of the forces of yin and yang which were always in a state of change seeking balance. Another concern of Chinese metaphysics, especially Taoism, is the relationship and nature of being and non-being. The Taoists held that the ultimate, the Tao, was also non-being or no presence. Other important concepts were those of spontaneous generation or natural vitality and correlative resonance. After the fall of the Han dynasty, China saw the rise of the Neo-Taoist Suangxiu school. This school was very influential in developing the concepts of later Chinese metaphysics. Buddhist philosophy entered China and was influenced by the native Chinese metaphysical concepts to develop new theories. The native Tiantai and Huayan schools of philosophy maintained and reinterpreted the Indian theories of Shunyata and Buddha nature into the theory of interpenetration of phenomena. Neo-Confucians like Zhang Zhe under the influence of other schools developed the concepts of principle and vital energy. Socrates is known for his dialectic or questioning approach to philosophy rather than a positive metaphysical doctrine. His pupil, Plato is famous for his theory of forms. Platonic realism is considered to be a solution to the problem of universals, i.e., what particular objects have in common is that they share a specific form which is universal to all others of their respective kind. The theory has a number of other aspects. Platonism developed into Neoplatonism, a philosophy with a monotheistic and mystical flavor that survived well into the early Christian era. Plato's pupil Aristotle wrote widely on almost every subject, including metaphysics. His solution to the problem of universals contrasts with Plato's. Whereas Platonic forms are existentially apparent in the visible world, Aristotelian essences dwell in particulars. Potentiality and actuality are principles of a dichotomy which Aristotle used throughout his philosophical works to analyze motion, causality, and other issues. The Aristotelian theory of change and causality stretches to four causes the material, formal, efficient and final. The efficient cause corresponds to what is now known as a cause simpliciter. Final causes are explicitly teleological, a concept now regarded as controversial in science. 
the matter-slash-form dichotomy was to become highly influential in later philosophy as the substance-slash-essence distinction. The opening arguments in Aristotle's Metaphysics, Book I, revolve around the senses, knowledge, experience, theory, and wisdom. The first main focus in the metaphysics is attempting to determine how intellect advances from sensation through memory, experience, and art, to theoretical knowledge. Aristotle claims that eyesight provides us with the capability to recognize and remember experiences, while sound allows us to learn. More on Indian philosophy, Hindu philosophy Skya is an ancient system of Indian philosophy based on a dualism involving the ultimate principles of consciousness and matter. It is described as the rationalist school of Indian philosophy. It is most related to the yoga school of Hinduism, and its method was most influential on the development of early Buddhism. The Samkhya is an enumerationist philosophy whose epistemology accepts three of six pramanas as the only reliable means of gaining knowledge. These include Pratyaka, Anuma, and Sabda. Samkhya is strongly dualist. Samkhya philosophy regards the universe as consisting of two realities, Purua and Prakti. Jiva is that state in which Purua is bonded to Prakti in some form. This fusion, state the Samkhya scholars, led to the emergence of Budhai and Ahakra. The universe is described by this school as one created by Purusa Prakti entities infused with various permutations and combinations of variously enumerated elements, senses, feelings, activity, and mind. During the state of imbalance, one of more constituents overwhelm the others, creating a form of bondage, particularly of the mind. The end of this imbalance, bondage is called liberation, or moksha, by the Samkhya school. The existence of God or Supreme Being is not directly asserted, nor considered relevant by the Samkhya philosophers. Skya denies the final cause of Ishvara. While the Samkhya school considers the Vedas as a reliable source of knowledge, it is an atheistic philosophy according to Paul Dusan and other scholars. A key difference between Samkhya and Yoga schools, state scholars, is that Yoga school accepts a personal, yet essentially inactive, deity or personal god. Samkhya is known for its theory of Gwas. Gwe, it states, are of three types, sattva being good, compassionate, illuminating, positive, and constructive, rajas is one of activity, chaotic, passion, impulsive, potentially good or bad, and tamas being the quality of darkness, ignorance, destructive, lethargic, negative. Everything, all life forms and human beings, state Samkhya scholars, have these three gwas, but in different proportions. The interplay of these gwas defines the character of someone or something, of nature, and determines the progress of life. The Samkhya theory of gwas was widely discussed, developed, and refined by various schools of Indian philosophies, including Buddhism. Samkhya's philosophical treatises also influenced the development of various theories of Hindu ethics. Realization of the nature of self-identity is the principal object of the Vedanta system of Indian metaphysics. In the Upanishads, self-consciousness is not the first-person indexical self-awareness or the self-awareness which is self-reference without identification and also not the self-consciousness which as a kind of desire is satisfied by another self-consciousness. It is self-realization, the realization of the self consisting of consciousness that leads all else. The word self-consciousness in the Upanishads means the knowledge about the existence and nature of Brahman. It means the consciousness of our own real being, 
the primary reality. Self-consciousness means self-knowledge, the knowledge of prujna i.e. of prana which is Brahman. According to the Upanishads the Atman or Paramatman is phenomenally unknowable, it is the object of realization. The Atman is unknowable in its essential nature, it is unknowable in its essential nature because it is the eternal subject who knows about everything including itself. The Atman is the knower and also the known. Metaphysicians regard the self either to be distinct from the Absolute or entirely identical with the Absolute. They have given form to three schools of thought A the dualistic school, B the quasi-dualistic school and C the monistic school, as the result of their varying mystical experiences. Prakriti and Atman, when treated as two separate and distinct aspects form the basis of the dualism of the Shvetashvatara Upanishad. Quasi-dualism is reflected in the Vaishnavite monotheism of Ramanuja and the Absolute Monism, in the teachings of Adi Shankara. Self-consciousness is the fourth state of consciousness or Turiya, the first three being Vaisvanara, Tejasa, and Prujna. These are the four states of individual consciousness. There are three distinct stages leading to self-realization. The first stage is in mystically apprehending the glory of the self within us as though we were distinct from it. The second stage is in identifying the I within with the self, that we are in essential nature entirely identical with the pure self. The third stage is in realizing that the Atman is Brahman, that there is no difference between the Self and the Absolute. The fourth stage is in realizing I am the Absolute, Aham Brahman Asmai. The fifth stage is in realizing that Brahman is the All that exists, as also that which does not exist. In Buddhist philosophy there are various metaphysical traditions that have proposed different questions about the nature of reality based on the teachings of the Buddha in the early Buddhist texts. The Buddha of the early texts does not focus on metaphysical questions but on ethical and spiritual training and in some cases, he dismisses certain metaphysical questions as unhelpful and indeterminate avyakta, which he recommends should be set aside. The development of systematic metaphysics arose after the Buddha's death with the rise of the Abhidharma traditions. The Buddhist Abhidharma schools developed their analysis of reality based on the concept of dharmas which are the ultimate physical and mental events that make up experience and their relations to each other. Noah Rankin has called their approach phenomenological. Later philosophical traditions include the Madhyamika school of Nagarjuna, which further developed the theory of the emptiness of all phenomena or dharmas which rejects any kind of substance. This has been interpreted as a form of anti-foundationalism and anti-realism which sees reality as having no ultimate essence or ground. The Yogacara school meanwhile promoted a theory called awareness only which has been interpreted as a form of idealism or phenomenology and denies the split between awareness itself and the objects of awareness. Islamic philosophy was highly active during Europe's Dark Ages, beginning with the arrival and translation of Aristotle into Arabic. Between about 1100 and 1500, Philosophy as a discipline took place as part of the Catholic Church's teaching system, known as scholasticism. Scholastic philosophy took place within an established framework blending Christian theology with Aristotelian teachings. Although fundamental orthodoxies were not commonly challenged, there were nonetheless deep metaphysical disagreements, particularly over the problem of universals which engaged Duns Scotus and Pierre Abelard. William of Ockham is remembered for his principle of ontological parsimony. In the early modern period, the system-building scope of philosophy is often linked to the rationalist method of philosophy, that is the technique of deducing the nature of the world by pure reason. 
the scholastic concepts of substance and accident were employed. British empiricism marked something of a reaction to rationalist and system-building philosophy, or speculative metaphysics as it was pejoratively termed. The skeptic David Hume famously declared that most metaphysics should be consigned to the flames. Hume was notorious among his contemporaries as one of the first philosophers to openly doubt religion, but is better known now for his critique of causality. John Stuart Mill, Thomas Reed, and John Locke were less skeptical, embracing a more cautious style of metaphysics based on realism, common sense, and science. Other philosophers, notably George Berkeley were led from empiricism to idealistic metaphysics. Immanuel Kant attempted a grand synthesis and revision of the trends already mentioned, scholastic philosophy, systematic metaphysics, and skeptical empiricism, not to forget the burgeoning science of his day. As did the system's builders, he had an overarching framework in which all questions were to be addressed. Like Hume, who famously woke him from his dogmatic slumbers, he was suspicious of metaphysical speculation, and also places much emphasis on the limitations of the human mind. Kant described his shift in metaphysics away from making claims about an objective noumenal world, towards exploring the subjective phenomenal world, as a Copernican revolution, by analogy to Copernicus' shift from man to the sun at the center of the universe. Kant saw rationalist philosophers as aiming for a kind of metaphysical knowledge he defined as the synthetic a priori that is knowledge that does not come from the senses but is nonetheless about reality. Inasmuch as it is about reality, it differs from abstract mathematical propositions, and being a priori it is distinct from empirical, scientific knowledge. The only synthetic a priori knowledge we can have is of how our minds organize the data of the senses, that organizing framework is space and time, which for Kant have no mind-independent existence, but nonetheless operate uniformly in all humans. A priori knowledge of space and time is all that remains of metaphysics as traditionally conceived. There is a reality beyond sensory data or phenomena which he calls the realm of noumena, however, we cannot know it as it is in itself, but only as it appears to us. He allows himself to speculate that the origins of phenomenal God, morality, and free will might exist in the noumenal realm, but these possibilities have to be set against its basic unknowability for humans. Although he saw himself as having disposed of metaphysics, in a sense, he has generally been regarded in retrospect as having a metaphysics of his own, and as beginning the modern analytical conception of the subject. Nineteenth-century philosophy was overwhelmingly influenced by Kant and his successors. Schopenhauer, Schelling, Fichte, and Hegel all pervade their own panoramic versions of German idealism, Kant's own caution about metaphysical speculation, and refutation of idealism, having fallen by the wayside. The idealistic impulse continued into the early 20th century with British idealists such as F. H. Bradley and J. M. E. McTaggart. Followers of Karl Marx took Hegel's dialectic view of history and refashioned it as materialism. During the period when idealism was dominant in philosophy, science had been making great advances. The arrival of a new generation of scientifically-minded philosophers led to a sharp decline in the popularity of idealism during the 1920s. Analytical philosophy was spearheaded by Bertrand Russell and G. E. Moore. Russell and William James tried to compromise between idealism and materialism with the theory of neutral monism. The early to mid-20th century philosophy also saw a trend to reject metaphysical questions as meaningless. 
The driving force behind this tendency was the philosophy of logical positivism as espoused by the Vienna Circle. At around the same time, the American pragmatists were steering a middle course between materialism and idealism. System-building metaphysics, with a fresh inspiration from science, was revived by A. N. Whitehead and Charles Harchern. The forces that shaped analytical philosophy the break with idealism, and the influence of science were much less significant outside the English-speaking world, although there was a shared turn toward language. Continental philosophy continued in a trajectory from post-Kantianism. The phenomenology of Husserl and others was intended as a collaborative project for the investigation of the features and structure of consciousness common to all humans, in line with Kant's basing his synthetic a priori on the uniform operation of consciousness. It was officially neutral with regards to ontology, but was nonetheless to spawn a number of metaphysical systems. Brentano's concept of intentionality would become widely influential, including on analytical philosophy. Heidegger, author of Being and Time, saw himself as refocusing on being qua being, introducing the novel concept of Dossian in the process. Classing himself an existentialist, Sartre wrote an extensive study of being and nothingness. The speculative realism movement marks a return to full-blooded realism. There are two fundamental aspects of everyday experience, change and persistence. Until recently, the Western philosophical tradition has arguably championed substance and persistence, with some notable exceptions, however. According to process thinkers, novelty, flux, and accident do matter, and sometimes they constitute the ultimate reality. In a broad sense, process metaphysics is as old as Western philosophy, with figures such as Heraclitus, Plotinus, Duns Scotus, Leibniz, David Hume, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling, Gustav Theodor Fechner, Friedrich Adolf Trendelenburg, Charles Renouvier, Karl Marx, Ernst Mach, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, Emil Bautru, Henri Bergson, Samuel Alexander, and Nicholas Berdyaev. It seemingly remains an open question whether major continental figures such as the late Martin Heidegger, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Gilles Deleuze, Michel Foucault, or Jacques Derrida should be included. In a strict sense, process metaphysics may be limited to the works of a few founding fathers, G. W. F. Hegel, Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, Henri Bergson, A. N. Whitehead, and John Dewey. From a European perspective, there was a very significant and early Whiteheadian influence on the works of outstanding scholars such as Emil Meyerson, Louis Couturat, Jean Wall, Robin George Collingwood, Philippe DeVoe, Hans Jonas, Dorothy M. Emmett, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, Enzo Pacey, Charlie Dunbar Broad, Wolf Mays, Ilya Prigozhin, Jules Wheelman, Jean Ladriere, Jill Deleuze, Wolfhard Pannenberg, and Reiner Wheel. While early analytic philosophy tended to reject metaphysical theorizing, under the influence of logical positivism, it was revived in the second half of the 20th century. Philosophers such as David K. Lewis and David Armstrong developed elaborate theories on a range of topics such as universals, causation, possibility, and necessity and abstract objects. However, the focus of analytical philosophy generally is away from the construction of all-encompassing systems and toward close analysis of individual ideas. Among the developments that led to the revival of metaphysical theorizing were Quine's attack on the analytic-synthetic distinction, 
which was generally taken to undermine Carnap's distinction between existence questions internal to a framework and those external to it. The philosophy of fiction, the problem of empty names, and the debate over existence's status as a property have all come of relative obscurity into the limelight, while perennial issues such as free will, possible worlds, and the philosophy of time have had new life breathed into them. The analytic view is of metaphysics as studying phenomenal human concepts rather than making claims about the noumenal world, so its style often blurs into philosophy of language and introspective psychology. Compared to system building, it can seem very dry, stylistically similar to computer programming or mathematics. Despite, or perhaps because of, this scientific dryness, it is generally regarded as having made progress where other schools have not. For example, concepts from analytical metaphysics are now routinely employed and cited as useful guides in computational ontologies for databases and to frame computer natural language processing and knowledge representation software. <laughs>